BG on TV in 5, 4, 3, 2... Striking! 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 And welcome to the Happy Tummy. I am BG. Striking! I am BG. Striking! I am BG. Striking! Strive for perfection, accept reality. I'm Mary Ellen Kowalski. And I'm Chase Will, and this is BG on TV. Tonight, we have a wide array of segments, starting off with a look at the No Impact Man. Colin Beaven is the No Impact Man, a blogger who has helped bring environmental awareness into the 21st century with his website, noimpactman.com. Let's see how one man made a difference. This year, BG is really stepping up its game when it comes to green initiatives. With projects such as the Green Roof, green tailgating, and other programs such as Friday Night Lights, they're really making a good impact on the environment. However, the university can only do so much. It's up to the students in order to implement these green initiatives. To find out more about some of these green initiatives, we're going to go talk to Abby Toby and learn all about her honors project. So tell us a little bit about your honors project. My honors project is that I am going no waste for an entire year, and that includes like things you throw in your garbage bin, mostly. Um, I'm still keeping some recycling because I am a student. So where did you come up with this idea? I first got inspired to do this project from Colin Bevin's No Impact Man. Uh, summer in 2010, a friend gave it to me to read, and then another friend gave it to me as a birthday present, like coincidentally. So uh, in GeoJourney, I really cut out using straws and napkins because they don't supply them with you. So what changes have you made in your lifestyle that were surprisingly easy and which ones would you recommend for other students to do? Some of the other things that students on campus can do include cutting out napkins. I mean, people reach for like 30 napkins for a lunch and do you really need that many napkins or straws or automatically reaching for the cup with the lid. Another thing is just make sure you recycle. Recycling bins are placed all over campus. It's not like they're hidden or an inconveniency for people. I created a compost bin here in the greenhouse and as you can see inside of it, all it is is basically like newspaper. And you can't smell anything if it's done right. I mean, it does not smell any, like anything right, except dirt and newspaper. And it's been a really interesting experience because I've never done anything like this. So I did a lot of research with the worms because it's a worm compost bin. I'm using red wigglers. You can get them at any fishing store, really. While Colin Bevan was here, I had the opportunity to talk to him about what it means to be sustainable on a college campus. Well, if a college student wants to live sustainably, it's hard because oftentimes they're in a dorm, so they have no control of the building operations. They eat a meal plan, so they have no control of where the food comes from. Like, everything is controlled by the institution. So, so for a college student to have less impact, what they need to do is actually join the local environmental club and then work with the environmental club to pressure the administration to do better by the food and by the building operations and this type of thing. If someone were going to try to do No Impact Man for themselves, the advice that I'd give them is to do it in community rather than to do it by themselves, like find a group of people to do it together because when you work together with a group, first of all, they so you support each other's values, but also you learn together and are able to do more things together. As a college student, there's a lot you can do to reduce your environmental impact that doesn't take much change in your day-to-day -day life. We hope you consider some of the things that Abby and Colin shared with us today, and we hope you implement them in your future. Thank you. Just think of how cool it would be if everyone on BG's campus got involved in being sustainable. And yeah, we start a group of our own. We should do it. Yeah. You know, every home game, many students and alumni tailgate before the game. With a capacity of over 23,000 at Dwight Perry Stadium, and with those fans tailgating before the game, the trash cans pile up. But luckily, many students volunteer to help recycle this mess. We sent Justin Grubb out on another wild adventure to find out what's happening. Hey, I'm Justin Grubb, and welcome to another one of my wild adventures. You're probably wondering what I'm doing. I'm enjoying one of college football's greatest traditions. I'm tailgating, but I'm green tailgating. What does recycling mean to you? Oh man, well it means a lot to me, but uh, I guess to sum it up, it means reducing like your impact on the earth um, and sustainable practices. You take all the bottles and the cans that you use and you put them in a bag and it's going to help the environment. So 
What does recycling mean to you? I'm a fan of recycling. Uh, I just think it's too little too late. And uh, I mean, it's a great cause, but I don't think it's enough to do anything right now. So what does sustainability mean to you? Sustainability is just another way that you can keep the environment going to do your part to just maintain what we have so it doesn't get any worse. You no, know, unfortunately, sustainability isn't common sense when it really should be. Um, sustainability, just the little daily things you do in life and um, keeping note of that and making the effort to help the world um, and the people around it. Green tailgaters drive golf carts to distribute green bags for other tailgaters to put their recyclables in. The green tailgaters then collect those bags and bring them back to the recycling center. The recyclables are sorted out to cardboard, glass, paper, and aluminum categories. Well, that was a lot of hard work. Green tailgating. Now if you want to get involved, contact Dr. Hennessy or just show up in front of the stadium before any home game. As for me, it's been Justin Grubb, and join me on my next wild adventure. You know, it's really cool that we can all make this a little bit of change while still having fun. Yeah, I mean, if Freddie Falcon does it, who doesn't want to do it? I know, and you know, all it takes is just that one extra trash bag each time you go out and party. Yeah, and you don't have to be a Debbie Downer and say <laughs> it's not going to happen. There's still a chance to be sustainable. People got to be bright. ROTC is a military program for college students that stands for Reserve Officer Training Course. Bowling Green has had an ROTC program since 1948. With that fine tradition heading into its 63rd year, we wanted to find out more about Bowling Green's ROTC program. ROTC is the Reserve Officer Training Corps. Uh, it's a program designed to turn either regular students or former enlisted personnel into military officers. To protect the enemy, that meant to protect you. Oh, so at any time you feel threatened. Um, feel lab is held every Thursday. Uh, we, we learn different skills. Uh, the MS 1s, 2s, and 3s will learn different skills and will kind of build up throughout the year and then that spills over into the next semester. Um, you'll learn basic skills, uh, medical things, um, you'll learn things about weapons, uh, battle drills, movement, military movement, stuff like that, how to march, salute, all that basic stuff and you'll kind of build, each lab builds on the one prior so by the end of the year you should, you should have a pretty good general knowledge of, of what the uh, the army is like. Stop, keep going, what do you do? Let's jump into the head. Stop. <laughs> um, well for college experience it's definitely you know, quite a big uh, bit of involvement. Um, you, you're always doing something weekly, almost daily. Stop! Well it's affected a lot. <laughs> it's because uh, it's pushed me to keep my grades up higher because the higher your grade point average is, the more likelihood you're going to get the job you want. It's pushed me physically, always striving to be better physically fitness-wise. And it's taught me a whole lot of tactics, techniques in the military and also how to just carry myself in public and how to deal with other people and work with other organizations. We're ready to go. Go ahead. I think a lot of people think that we're a bunch of nerds playing Army. Um, I know that a lot of my friends who aren't in ROTC have asked me what we do, and when I tell them, they're like really surprised that it's actually that kind of hard and that it's that involved with the real Army. Probably the most challenging part is just balancing your time and time management because well, most of us, like myself, we're up at 5 o'clock in the morning and doing, doing PT usually about two hours in the morning. And then we go to class pretty much all day. Then I have uh, commitments and responsibilities to ensure to get done in battalion. And I'm usually going to bed about 12 o'clock at night just because of homework. So. It's, not like, it's not like you sit there for the first time going over this, okay, great location, pick up something. You're going to know where you're at ahead of time. Um, for my uh, after college, it, you know, I plan on getting a commission and um, 
going with the quartermaster corps, which is supply and logistics. So that'll be a, that'll be a full time active duty job. EBW team searches and clears all enemy personnel. On the I just received my branch last week, and I'm going to be branching aviation. So I'll be going to flight school in about a year, year and a half or so. So I've been going to two years of flight school, and then uh, we'll be flying helicopters for the military. You know, every time I walk past that training course, I always want to try it out. It reminds me of the jungle gym as a kid, except you actually learn a lot of life lessons from it. I mean, they teach you everything. I never knew exactly what ROTC was until now. That's awesome. I didn't know they did so much stuff. And these guys are dedicated. I thought getting up at 7 in the morning was hard. These guys are up every morning at like 5. Wow, they're so dedicated. Imagine how hard it is to go to school, wake up, and go run around campus. Unbelievable. Wow. You know, photography has been said to be a new art form with only a century of existence. And with the onset of digital age, the art form continues to evolve and develop. That is where new media artist Krista Sa from Bowling Green comes in. We took a look into what the local artist is up to in another segment of The Gallery. I'm Krista Sa and I'm an artist. I guess I'd be considered a new media artist because I use new technology as a medium but I consider myself to be a photographer and a video maker. I just kind of know how to approach it and what I want to explore in it. And um, like the more I find out through those images is kind of where my artist statement and like my purpose as an artist comes from. As a photographer, I think I take pictures mostly of things that just interests me and I tend to find out what really interests me by the photographs themselves. Like I never have a solid idea before taking a picture or doing a video. I guess I'm like really interested in the things that I find confusing and challenging and almost disgusting or gross, but I also really appreciate them. It's not like out of irony, it's really out of like thinking outside of my taste. I really do try to see something in things that are really overlooked or things that you just kind of take for granted and try to understand them. I never really have like a set idea like when I'm going to make the work or how it's going to look or anything. I guess when it just kind of feels right I take the picture, like, it could be something as, like, sporadic as, like, just seriously seeing somebody. Like, there's this really great picture I have of, it's, like, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. It's this guy and this woman in a park in Philadelphia, and the guy's taking a nap with his head on her butt, and he's, like, looking, the, or, and she's looking the other way. And, like, just those moments, I mean, that's my process. Just when you see something that is, like, so inspiring and just so, like, mundane but also really pure and really beautiful. I think those are, that's what makes me take a picture. So in any kind of creative process, you should always try to challenge an audience. And people are a lot smarter than you think they are. So you should really, really, really work hard putting your effort into challenging them. really being a good person and I use art as a vehicle for that and that might not be as easily seen as it is for like how how I feel when I make the work and stuff and I, I think that regardless of what profession or what your interest is you should always consider how we can make humanity stronger and better it's pretty cool how just sporadic the inspiration is for her photos. Yeah, she has such a unique style. I love that she goes out and finds disgusting things and makes it into an awesome piece of artwork. And the way she can just challenge an audience. I mean, not many people do that. You read things and you think about how you learned stuff so long ago. She keeps it fresh. She really does. It's so awesome to see what she can do. Mm -hmm. It comes to no surprise to many of my fellow Bowling Green ladies that hair salons are a big business in America. So we want to take a look into Revolve, a local hair salon located on Worcester Street. Hey, 
Well, I've owned it for, it'll be three years come February. I think the dynamics that we have going on through here, like we have a very diverse clientele um, being over here, but um, we have six, you know, the six women, we're, our we work very well together, there's no tension, and we just keep it very um, client oriented. So when you come in here, you know it's all about you. There's over 50 years experience between the six of us. Uh, start just men, women's haircuts, children, uh, pedicures, nails, uh, the acrylic nails, manicures, shellac, um, the Global Keratin. The Global Keratin is a, is a hair taming system that will take your hair back to its youthful state. It's best for those that have the unmanageable hair that they want to have the get wash and go look. Um, it's perfect for that. Once you have it done, it lasts up to three to five months that you can literally wash your hair, dry it and out the door, or leave it air dry, whatever, and you don't have that uncontrollable frizz. It takes about two and a half hours processed where you shampoo your hair, we apply the product, and then um, you blow dry it out with a round brush and then go through with the flat iron and that kind of seals the um, the product into it. It is a non-chemical product, so you don't have to worry about any formaldehyde or um, any byproducts that way. And just recently, Nicole, one of our stylists, became certified in the hair extensions. I'm sure that we're going to be doing some some type of specials. Um, usually, do like a, a gift certificate. Um, run those type where if you would spend, you know, buy a $50 gift certificate, it would only cost you $35 or something like that. There's always somebody working at least Monday through Saturday. So there aren't set hours because the, um, every stylist, they all vary, but you can guarantee that there's usually someone in here at least by nine o'clock in the morning and they'll walk out until eight o'clock at night. I definitely stand behind that. We definitely, you know, do our best to stay true to that, to where when you come in the, you know, you're our sole, you know, priority at, in, to make you feel the best that you can. So when you leave, you're, you know, we just made your day. It's like come to the place where the world revolves around you. I had no idea there was such a great hair salon in Bowling Green, especially one that treats the patient so well. I didn't know you could use natural products and make your hair look young. I mean, if I hadn't known that sooner. <laughs> yeah, that would have helped a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, since the Wright brothers took the first flight in 1903, Ohio's had a proud tradition when it comes to aerospace technology. Bowling Green does its part to contribute to the aerospace industry with its aviation department, located at the edge of the north side of campus. You might not have noticed their headquarters, but you probably have seen their planes flying in the skies above campus. I'm, the, uh, I'm Dr. John McDermott, I'm the director of the Aviation Studies Program uh, at BGSU, have been for the past 13 years. And basically I am uh, kind of give us a strategic direction on where we are going to go in educating our, our aviation students uh, for the future. We have three majors in Aviation Studies, there's of course a professional pilot major we, we call Flight Technologies and Operations. There's an aviation management and operations major, and we've just added an aviation engineering technology major. Well, basically, uh, the students go to work uh, through a co-op for usually aviation enterprises, businesses, and not only does that give them experience in the business world, but it also gives them contacts, uh, meeting pilots, meeting uh, maintenance technicians, meeting uh, business managers, airport managers, those type of folks, they can meet them and then hopefully uh, share their resume and uh, look for employment after graduation. As far as pilots goes, we have uh, BGSU graduates flying for the airlines. Uh, we have uh, BGS graduates flying for corporate aviation, which are the business aircraft that you see flying around the country. We have uh, management majors at uh, small airports, large airports like Cleveland Hopkins. Uh, we don't have any aviation engineering technology graduates yet, but we anticipate folks, uh, students who graduate with that 
major will probably go into aviation or aircraft manufacturing. But starting out as a pilot, you don't make a lot of money. Uh, it's similar to the medical profession in that you have to gain experience, and the more experience you gain, the higher your pay levels go. So you start out uh, making 25 to 35,000 typically, and then you go up from there. Uh, uh, a professional pilot who's been with a major air carrier like United or American Airlines, Delta Airlines, uh, they could be making 150,000 a year, but they've been with the company probably for 15 to 20 years. The university owns nine airplanes uh, that we fly really all over the Midwest. We have two simulation, flight simulation devices that are FAA approved, so they're, they're uh, more complicated than your little laptop computer game. So we have two of those, and of course we have uh, classroom facilities, uh, faculty and staff that are here to help the students uh, succeed in their careers. So I'm always amazed that uh, students don't realize we have a flight education process here. And uh, you know we have BGSU on the side of the airplanes and everything, and, and they always, uh, when I go to the rec center or over at the Union and I'll, uh, I'll query a student and say, do you know we have a flight school on campus or a flight education program? And they go, we do? Because <laughs> nobody knows we exist. But that's okay. I'm sure there are other majors on campus that have the same, same uh, problem with uh, promoting themselves. But we're trying. It's so cool that we have a flight program here. Did you know that? I honestly didn't. I I'm, I'm came here as a theater major because I didn't know about flight, and now i got to drop my major. You know what? It looks really cool, especially that we have all those planes. It's so cool. I know what I want for Christmas. Yeah, you better put that on your list. I know. I need a plane. <laughs> to end tonight, we'll leave you with a somber note and look into a recovery home in Bowling Green. As we all go about our day, it is easy to get caught up in our own lives and busy schedules. But while we're focused on our schedules, thousands of women and children are being trafficked into this country. It is a topic rarely discussed and is just now gaining more attention. Human trafficking is a growing problem in our own hometowns. Jeff Wilbarger, founder of The Daughter Project, has been on a mission to help victims of this crime and has been in the process of building the first recovery home in Ohio, and there are only a handful of recovery homes all over the country. The Daughter Project has been in existence for not quite three years, probably about two and a half years, and we have about seven different committees now. There's a healing committee and an education committee and a fundraising and an awareness committee and a legal committee and all those different committees. Are all, they're all volunteer people, attorneys and college students and, and uh, nurses and pediatricians and uh, teachers, and they're all working together in each one of their parts of the program to help uh, develop a program for, for girls to recover from sex trafficking. At this point now, the, pretty much all the decisions have been made, all the programs are in place, and we're just about done with our construction. So the home was almost built maybe two or three weeks and we'll be done with the construction. And then we'll be working with the local juvenile course and children's services, and then uh, hopefully, we're hoping before the end of the year, but it might take a little longer than that, the girls will actually begin being placed with us and we'll start helping them. About three years ago, my son-in-law had given me a book called Not For Sale, and it was about trafficking around the world and here in the U.S., and I didn't realize it was such a major problem, and so I just didn't feel comfortable um, just living my life as if I hadn't read that book. So there was just no way I could go on living kind of a normal life, I guess. It was, it was just incredible to read the stories. In fact, I didn't even read the whole book because after just a few chapters, it was just, uh, just so awful to think people were suffering through such a thing. So then I found a few friends and um, asked them to think about and pray about joining me and, and forming a board uh, and creating an organization to help victims recover from sex trafficking. We are a nonprofit organization and, and we're, we strive to be that in the truest sense of the word, word because we're, we're all volunteers and not any of us that are getting a salary. And so that makes it easier for us, at least for me personally, to, to raise money to get people encouraged to support us because the money's not going to me and it's not so I can, uh, you know, have a company car or something like that. I do this as a volunteer. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching students mathematics for the last 25 years at, at uh, you know, the University of Toledo, even not, not Bowling Green, but UT, and, uh, and Owens and local high schools and things. And I very, I very much enjoy my career and I, I plan to keep doing that. So being the director of the Daughter Project is just, it's just a sense of calling to, to help these girls and that's what everybody else is serving. The only employees that we'll actually have will be the house moms that live in the home with the girls and then our, our case manager. I encourage people to go to our website, 
thedaughterproject.org, and they can find out all about us. And uh, you know, and that's what we want. We want people to know what we're doing. And if you believe in our mission, then then come join us. And whether that means joining a committee, or praying for the people and for the girls and for the home, or getting involved with the construction, although there's not too much left of that to do, which is which is really exciting. Or um, you know, sending a donation involved, getting involved with our adopted daughter program. So we'd be glad to have anybody that anybody that has a heart for this and, and has some gift, talent, or ability in some way that wants to get involved, just get a hold of us through the website and we'll get you connected. Join Break the Silence, Break the Chains, and the Daughter Project in our fight to stop human trafficking and help victims find hope once again. You know, it's guys like Jeff that just amaze me. I mean, this guy took this one look at a book and he found his life's mission and he took time to build something for the world. Yeah, he didn't, like, he couldn't read the book and just drop the thought. He had to do something about it. He had to make changes happen and he did and in such a short amount of time. It's powerful stuff. Not many people have the strength to do that. With that, it's time to end the show. Thank you to all who appeared in tonight's show. Yes, if you'd like to take our show on the go, you can watch the show at wbgu.org backslash TV, Or you can get in touch with us on Facebook. Or you can even email the show at bgontvshow at gmail.com. Until next time, this has been BG on TV. Thank you.